Hi, this is David Thornburg, President and CEO of the Committee of 70. Welcome to Studio C70, which is our webcast and podcast uh, that explores issues of how we can strengthen our local democracy. And I'm joined today by Kathy Bookfar, Secretary of the Commonwealth here in Pennsylvania. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks for having me, David. And we've got a lot to talk about because this election season is turning out to be perhaps one of the most uh, interesting in the history of the Commonwealth uh, and of the United States. And uh, as Secretary of the Commonwealth, Kathy uh, sits atop the whole architecture of uh, election uh, systems and election delivery and uh, has a lot on her shoulders right now. So appreciate your being with us. Absolutely. First order of business is uh, just a little reflection from you. You've been in this job for just a little more than a year. Right, right. Um, and uh, I think I know the answer to this question, but I suspect when you, uh, when the governor called and you, you, you took his call and agreed to serve, that you had no idea that you would be running into uh, this kind of situation with this COVID-19 and, and the implications for elections and, and everything. No, I mean, you know, look, we all know this is completely uncharted territory. And uh, I always knew that, uh, 2020 was going to be an extremely busy, challenging year. Um, and each, each sort of couple of months in the lead up to this have, uh, have both, you know, I know we're going to be talking about things like Act 77 and Act 12 of 2020. So there have been many different phases of the last year that have uh, shifted the the, the course of the lead up to 2020, but of course, none so much as COVID-19. So uh, I have to, though, give huge kudos to the Department of State team, to the county election offices, who have been just quickly adjusting, um, you know, managing, asking for what they, their change needs are. So there's a lot of work to do, but thank goodness we have a lot of incredibly dedicated people doing it. They're the, uh, the first responders of our election systems. Indeed. Let's talk about uh, the two pieces, uh, significant pieces of legislation that the governor and legislature agreed upon, one last fall and one more recently, that, that make significant changes to, uh, to the way Pennsylvanians vote. So just lead us through Act 77 and, and, and Act 12 more recently and what, what that means for Pennsylvania voters. Sure. Well, so Act 77, you know, uh, brought more election reforms to Pennsylvania than any legislation in, in over eight decades in Pennsylvania. So huge, uh, very positive piece of legislation that included a number of really great voter, like voter um, reforms, voter supporting options for voters. So, for example, Every single Pennsylvania voter can now vote by mail for any reason or no reason at all. And obviously that, that particular part of the legislation is hugely important right now as we're dealing with COVID-19. Um, other major changes in Act 77 were extending the registration deadline. So it's now 15 days before the election rather than 30 days before the election. Again, this is another critical piece that has relevance in a way we didn't anticipate then now, um, there's also the ability for people to sign up for permanent mail-in voting. So by permanent, it's actually an annual process. So annually can, permanent. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a bit of a bit misnomer, but the permanent aspect of it is you're signing up to be put on a list. And every year in February, you will get a letter from your county saying, do you want to vote by mail in every election held this year? And that's primaries, that's special elections, that's general elections, all that you're eligible for. Um, if you say yes, you'll automatically get a ballot in the mail for every election that year. Again, this is really helpful both in times where we're not dealing with the pandemic and especially helpful for now when we are, when we're all under stay at home orders. So, um, you know, there were, and there were many other changes as well in Act 77, but those are some of the big ones. Yep. And more recently, the legislation that uh, was passed to, to move the primary also 
made some refinements to some of the changes uh, from Act 77. Yeah, so there were some great, great additions. So for example, um, one of the things that's sort of a, the combination of the two pieces of legislation. Um, so we're, we're all in the stay at home orders now. So everybody, you know, should stay safe and stay healthy. But once we can emerge and once the election offices are back uh, in business, um, people can go to their election office um, and register to vote while they're there apply for a mail-in ballot while they're there. Once they're determined eligible, they'll be handed a ballot. They could literally fill out the ballot while they're in the election office and hand it in. So it's an all-in-one um, option that didn't exist before. So this is a huge voter access win. Um, but again, can't take advantage of it right now while we're all under stay-at-home orders, but it's a great advantage for Pennsylvanians. Um, the other thing that Act 12 did, Act 12 of 2020, is that recognizing that there's going to be a huge increase, in fact, has already been a huge increase in mail-in ballots, it also provided for some um, earlier canvassing of those paper ballots by the counties. Canvassing mean counting. It does, yes. Yeah. So there's a number of different parts of that process. Um, so, for example, in Pennsylvania, you have the name and the, you know, on the outside of the envelope, so eligibility, eligibility of the voter can be checked by the county. Um, the names of the people who applied for the ballot can be provided to poll watchers, to parties, to candidates in case there's going to be any challenges. Um, but then the actual opening of the outer envelope, scanning through the scanner, counting of the votes is kind of the final part of the canvassing process. Yeah. So I want to yeah. talk more about mail voting because I know that's gotten a huge amount of attention. But but first, walk us through. I think people underappreciate the challenges of, of implementing a piece of legislation, particularly in this area where, you know, uh, as, as you know well, voting is is a highly distributed process. It, it happens at the county level and at the local level. We've got thousands of people working behind the table at election boards and as election directors in the county. So it's, it's, a, it's a complex process um, that, that demands uh, a lot of um, uh, guidance uh, from folks like you, uh, but also just kind of the good old fashioned implementation and execution at a very local level. So what are the, some of the challenges that, that folks face now in implementing uh, changes to the law. Yeah, I mean it's uh, and it's and it's ongoing, right? So this is a the current situation. You know, obviously we're monitoring day by day the conditions um, and where we're going to be eight weeks from now on June second. Um, so the Pennsylvania has, as you as you referred to, has a very decentralized election system. So you have the Department of State overseeing things from the state level, but then each of the 67 counties has their, runs their own election in effect. So each part of implementation of a law, even a simple law, has a lot of different component pieces of it. As you, as you uh, alluded to, you know, from the top down to the voter, to every piece of the operation in between. So, so for example, a, a very complicated piece of legislation like this one, like these two, um, involved really inc the most incredibly concentrated efforts I've ever seen in the shortest period of time to make sure that we carried out all aspects of this these changes. So, for example, um, we had already we had thank goodness already created online absentee ballot applications last year, and so we already had a framework to then just amend that to add on mail-in voting applications. So that was great that we had that, that foundation. Got, but even just adding on an entirely different uh, process, um, though parallel to the absentee process, took a huge amount of IT resources, program area resources, to make sure that everything worked exactly as it should be. Yeah. So that all got done, and we were able to roll that out um, effective February 11th, which is phenomenal. Um, and then we also added email notifications. So from the technological side of things, 
that was really important to us because you're having huge swaths of voters who are now voting by mail. And I'll tell you, as of this morning, um, more than 350,000 voters have already signed up to vote either absentee or mail-in. And just to give you context, that's more than three times as many that voted absentee in 2016. Wow. And we in the primary. Yeah. And we yeah. still have eight weeks to go. So that's yeah. great. People are using it. Um, there's a, there's another huge piece of this, which I know uh, probably weighs on you and your folks, which is voter education and awareness. And I know you and I talked a couple of weeks ago, we, we stand ready to do everything we can in our networks to uh, make sure that folks understand the basics, to point them to your website, votespa.com. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, but, uh, you know, I think those of us in the weeds underappreciate how little attention most voters pay to this process until they're down to the wire. So how do you think about that challenge and what's, what's the call that should go out to, to individual citizens, to universities, companies, civic groups? What are you suggesting that they do, that we do to, to help spread the word? So it's going to take every one of us to reach all the voters, because again, this was a sea change. So thank you for pointing people to votespa.com. And not only that, um, we created, so long before anybody had ever heard of COVID-19, and long before we had any idea that Act 77 was coming, um, we created the Department of State at, uh, initiative called Ready to Vote 2020. And initially it was created because we already knew that we had 67 counties who were rolling out new voting machines with voter verifiable paper ballots, which in and of itself was a huge sea change. So yeah, we skipped over that part about the exactly. new election machines and the funding for that. And that feels exactly. like it was a hundred years ago, right? <laughs> right. If we were, I mean, if we were having this conversation a year ago, that would have been entirely what we would be, we would have been talking about pretty much. And in fact, I'm sure we did. Um, yeah. So, so what I, so what I'd love the help of every organization, every elected official, every um, person who just knows about this to share with, and, and we made it easy. So we created this Ready to Vote 2020 initiative, which has language, it has the deadlines, it has you know images that you could literally cut and paste. You could put on your, if you're a, say, I, you know, I've talked to legislators, you could put it on a legislative mailing where it's from you, but we make it packaged and easy to go. So if we had every business, every organization, every individual telling 10 friends, 100 colleagues, um, here's the information, here's the new deadlines, here's where you apply to vote by mail, anybody can do it now, um, that would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, we hesitate to use the term going viral these days, but it, it, it will take that, it will take one individual, talking to you know, other members of the family or the community and so forth and so on to get that kind of a, a cascading effect. Uh, yeah. to, because, uh, yeah, as I said, the, the, the challenge is, they're about, what's the number, 7 million registered voters in Pennsylvania? Something like there's, that? There's 8.5 million registered voters, but there's about a little over 7 million registered Republicans and Democrats, so who okay. are eligible for the primary. For the primary, okay, yeah. great. Um, let's drop down to some of the particularly perplexing questions that I think are going to surface before the primary on, on June 2nd. Um, one is the Act 12 of 2020 al allowed for counties to move polling places uh, or even consolidate polling places. And there's, um, as I recall, not a whole lot of guidance in the legislation about what you can do and what you can't do which has two potential issues. One is voters showing up at, you know, the old elementary school or the old retirement community that they used to vote in, only to find it's no longer a polling place. And then more um, perniciously, uh, the potential for counties to move polling places in a way that they're no longer accessible to people. So what you're thinking about how we can respond to those challenges. Yeah, um, so it's a great question. And, you know, I think, and just so that we're clear, the part of Act 12 that relates to consolidation of polling places 
only applies to the primary of 2020. So this is not a permanent change. So everybody should feel reassured that it's gonna all go back to regular polling places once we don't have to worry about you know, the, the COVID-19 right. issues. So, but for the primary, I really wanted to make sure, we wanted to make sure that there were, um, that, you know, and we may talk about this during this conversation about, well, there's been a lot of move towards vote by mail, which I think is great, but you can't go from, from zero to 100%, you know, vote by mail without really risking disenfranchising voters. So we wanted to find um, methods of voting, of holding the election, that both allowed people to go to a physical polling place while dealing with the reality that counties are facing closing of a lot of their polling places and reductions of poll workers who are afraid to be poll workers during right. this time, understandably. So what we did was in Act 12, we allowed the counties to reduce by 60% their, poll, their polling places. Um, and they, if they have, you know, emergency necessity of cause, they can ask for further reduction, but Department of State has to approve that plan. So, and we are putting out, Department of State within the next week or so, we'll be sending the counties guidance that will give them the general, as you could imagine, you know, making sure that they take into account, you know, population centers and um, accessibility, parking, you know, uh, closeness to public uh, transportation routes and that kind of thing. So all those factors will be taken into account, um, trying to find that balance where we have uh, the ability for people to go in person and vote while also taking into account that we've got a pandemic right yep. now. Yep. There's another sticky issue, which is some folks scratching their head, which is college students uh, who, you know, I'm from Massachusetts, I'm in school in Pennsylvania, I registered to vote in Pennsylvania, but now I've been sent home. And even the question of if I apply for an absentee ballot, where, where does it go to? Uh, how, how, how do you respond to that? What, what kind of help can you give people about that issue? It, yeah, it's, and it's, it's a lot of different questions rolled in one, right? Um, so I have a 21-year-old daughter who's a junior in college in Massachusetts. And she's here now. Um, but she is the exact example of your hypothetical. So she had applied for an absentee ballot um, when she thought she was gonna be there. Now, so I'll start out by saying it used to be in Pennsylvania before Act 77, there was a presumption that if you applied for an absentee and then you were going to be in your precinct, that you had to show up in person and vote by regular ballot and void your absentee. That's no longer the case in Pennsylvania. So. Act 77 shifted it so that once you've applied for an absentee or a mail-in ballot, that's the way you should continue your vote. So for my daughter, I would advise her and anybody like her, so she had already applied for her absentee. At the time that she applied for her absentee, she was going to be absent from her, her municipality. So that makes total sense. It's all about your intent at the time of the, of the submitting of the application. Mm -hmm. Act 12 also removed the ability to challenge a ballot because somebody filed the wrong one. So if, so my daughter is no longer gonna necessarily be absent, maybe she could have done mail-in, but she can't be challenged for that. So her ballot, what she should do is she should, any voter like her should A, forward their mail. So she was supposed to be in Massachusetts. She should make sure her mail is forwarded but we also are recommending that people call their county board of elections, be patient because recognize that a lot of the employees are also staying at home and so they may not get back to you quickly. But you can update, you can ask for a new, for the ballot to be sent to a different address than what you had already applied for. Yep. So either one of those or both, make sure your mail is forwarded, um, call the county election office, you can, they will make those accommodations because again, none of us have, you can't predict these kinds of changes and they will make those changes. Yeah. Um, I said earlier, I wanted to dig in a little further on voting by mail and voting at home. Uh, I had um, uh, last week did an interview with Amber McReynolds, who you may run into, who runs the National Vote at Home Institute and who I think is just a 
a very impressive and articulate advocate for the advantages of voting at home. Um, and uh, a couple things. One, you know, she's of the opinion that says we have to, we've got sort of a two-step process here in Pennsylvania. We've got, a, and you have to uh, send in an application for a, a vote, a, a mail ballot, get sent to you, then you get sent back. She's of the opinion that says, let's just cut out the middleman and, and send people mail ballots. Um, and I know there was legislation uh, suggesting that. Um, you know, there are also uh, recently uh, all kinds of wild allegations about security issues uh, that relate to uh, mail voting um, that I'm sure uh, give you some frustration. Um, but, and, and there are more basic concerns that people, people don't necessarily trust the post office the way they used to, or maybe the way they should. And then just to double down on that, there's the post office is reeling because not as much mail is being delivered, so their revenues are down. And so just help us unpack some of those vote by mail or vote at home issues and maybe give people some sense of confidence about how this is all gonna play out. So I'll start out with the security piece, David, because I do think there has been a tension there lately. And you know, I wanna make sure that people can, can separate reality from allegations. And so there's a, there's a thorough checking of eligibility by our county election offices. So if you submit, so for example, if you go online and you apply for a mail-in ballot, you have to enter your driver's license number. So there's an immediate check of are you who you say you are by checking your driver's license number where you also have your address. And it so it, it requires verification to even be processed. Same for by mail. They're, they're looking you up online. They're either checking you against the social security database if that's the, the digits that you put in or against the driver's license database. And so you're not being sent so the advantage of having an application process, um, though yes, there is a middle step, is that that's where the eligibility takes place. Now, in other states where they do all vote by mail, first of all, um, we've been having a lot of conversations. You know, I'm co-chair of the Elections Committee of the National Association of Secretaries of State, and we've been having a, a weekly meetings um, because obviously we're all going through the same thing at the same time. And you know the the states that have gone to vote by mail, generally it's taken five years to really get to the point where they have confidence in the engagement of their voters, the knowledge of their voters, the confidence in the list. This is not something that can happen overnight. Um, though obviously in, in cases of emergency, you have to make quick adjustments for the time period. Um, but I think the processes that are in place in Pennsylvania are very. Um, clear the county election offices do them well there's opportunity for challenge for people having identity that's different than what is alleged but again it's so easily verifiable by the counties so yeah. so i really think people should have high confidence in their ability to vote securely and for everybody else to be voting securely by mail but i will say that the the u.s postal service piece of it um, people should, once again, once we're able to, um, to emerge from our homes and we're no longer on the stay at home order, you know, you, you can now drop off your mail in ballot or your absentee ballot until 8 p.m. on election night. Don't wait that long. Once you get the ballot, get it in the mail or drop it off in person as soon as you possibly can. And that way you don't have to worry about it being caught in the mail. Yeah, that's a piece of of the process that I think hasn't quite sunk in that uh, while it's called a mail ballot, there's nothing that prevents you from taking it to your, you know, to city hall or to the county board of elections and literally just handing it in. So that's right. about as secure as, as you can get. Um, let me just uh, wrap up by getting your sort of reflection on what happened in Wisconsin uh, the other day, which, uh, my words are not yours. I, I find a, a just a political disgrace um, and uh, uh, I think revealed all kinds of the just um, unfortunate aspects of how political this process has become. Uh, and actually, I, 
uh, ran a, an op-ed piece in the uh, Inquirer today um, that uh, suggests how bad that was and how we ought to learn from that. But I guess the question to you: Do you have do you have nightmares that that could happen in Pennsylvania? Well, you know what I don't. Um, if only because we're we're never waiting till the night before or the day before to make, you know, originally we were having the same conversation about Ohio, right? I mean, Ohio went through this and then Wisconsin went through this. Now, I, I can't imagine that those conversations couldn't have happened sooner or the core challenges couldn't have happened sooner. We are eight weeks out from election day now and we're, monitoring this every day. And the governor and secretary of health and the entire cabinet, we have twice weekly cabinet meetings. We are getting full um, briefings on every aspect of this. There's surge planning. There's, you know, at Department of State, because we're also involved in professional licensing and certifications, is also deeply involved in planning to make sure that we have, you know, equipment and providers and facilities. So we are very closely involved in the process and are and work very, very closely with the 67 counties. So that I, I don't have nightmares about that because I feel very confident that we will make decisions well ahead of time and plan accordingly. Yeah, that's a great point. The, what, what brought on the catastrophe in Wisconsin was the fact that they waited till the absolute last minute and then the first starts to fly um, and there's just no way you can resolve that in the space of 24 or 48 uh, hours. By the way, I, I've, I've seen uh, a couple of um, posts on social media around uh, uh, security issues, particularly around elections. And I always found the most articulate and persuasive spokespeople are the folks on the front lines uh, to say, you know, I serve on a board of elections or I'm a, I'm a clerk of elections or a director of elections, and let me tell you how this works, uh, and that uh, we, we treat this you know, seriously and professionally. Uh, so you know, that, that is the advantage of having this community network of people, some volunteers and some professionals who, who work on this. And I, it gives, gives me some confidence, and, and I hope others. Yeah, agreed. It, and they've been incredibly helpful, the people on the front lines, the county election offices. Um, really, from when you were asking me about Act 77, I forgot to mention that one of the first things we did was form a work group with about 11 different county election folks, also a couple of county commissioners, CCAP, the County Commissioner Association of Pennsylvania, as well as Department of State folks and the governor's office and the IT office so that we had all the different component pieces looking at every aspect of implementation and whether that's before COVID or during COVID, that communications that were um, taking advantage of people's expertise and direct knowledge on these issues, they're all folded in. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, any lost, last thoughts uh, for people as we approach uh, June 2nd, November 3rd? Uh, so stay safe and stay home most importantly but, but while doing that, go on to votespa.com. Uh, you could check your registration status. You can update your registration. And then I do highly recommend that you go ahead and vote and apply for a mail-in or absentee ballot. The other thing I want to make sure I say is put in your email address, please, because if you enter your email address, you'll get those email notifications when your ballot, when your application is approved, when your ballot is going out in the mail to you, when they receive your ballot back from you, it takes all the guessing out of it and it takes all the worrying out of it. So yeah. enter your email address, you'll get those notifications. You can do it from the comfort of your own home and hope that everybody's families and yourselves stay safe. Great. Uh, I can testify to, uh, I've signed up to vote by mail and I didn't realize the email notification aspect until I got in there. And that's, that's a huge feature. And uh, I, uh, encourage my wife to do so. I would encourage our dogs, except they're, they're not voters. Uh, so uh, no option there, but that's, that's a, that's a really um, thoughtful feature that should give people some, some reassurance. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for joining us. Uh, best of luck. And I'm, you know, I'm sure we'll be uh, talking to each other down the trail and, and we're uh, 
uh, glad to do anything we can to support your efforts. Thanks so much, David, and thanks everybody. Appreciate your public education support.